So we are in a series called Pressed. And week one, we talked about the oil press. Week two, we talked about the bench press. Last week was summer conference. This week, we're going to talk about the full court press. The full court press, which is a basketball term. In all sports, baseball, football, soccer, hockey, whatever it is, there is an understanding that in order to win, you must put pressure on your opponent. You must put pressure on your opponent. In football, it's called the blitz, yep. right? To put pressure on the quarterback, it's called the blitz, where we're going to send more defensive linemen at the quarterback than there are offensive players to block them. And in basketball, it's called the full court press. You see, the full court press is an instance of aggressive pressure. It's an instance of aggressive pressure. And I thought to myself as I was, I shared this sermon out twice, and I've never talked about this, but I thought to myself for a second, how come they don't just play like that the whole game? How come they don't play the full court press the whole game? What, what it normally looks like, a normal, I don't even know what it's called, whatever, a possession, a normal possession they start the ball from out of bounds, they check it in bounds to one of their players, he takes the ball, and he goes to at least half court before anybody even looks at him. He gets all the way to half court before anybody even cares that he's got the ball. And I'm thinking to myself, look at how much ground you just gave away. A full court press, however, is the guy's out of bounds, there's already a defender on him right here. He's playing defense, and the guy's not even in bounds yet. Every one of my players is guarding every one of their players. They're playing man-to-man -man position. They're playing right on them. And if, by chance, the ball does get checked in bounds to me, two defenders are going to come block me and, and guard me, every, 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 whoever gets the ball. That's the full court press. It's an instance of aggressive pressure, an instance of aggressive pressure. Today we're going to talk about this full court press because I believe that there needs to be times in our life where we get to a point that we say enough's enough. Enough's enough. Enough's enough. There's got to be a time that we get to a place in our lives where we say enough's enough with being sick. Where we get to a place where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired and we're going to do something about it. Right? We need to get to a place where we say, I'm not going to give one inch to the enemy in my life. I'm, I'm going to get right in his face and I'm going to shut this thing down. I'm going to stand my ground. We need to get to a place in our lives where we say, I'm going to press myself to be better today than I was yesterday. And I think that's the fault with us as a society today. Many of us have gotten to a place where we say, as long as today is as good as yesterday, I'm okay with that. I don't care if it's any better, just as long as it's not any worse. See, there's a difference between playing to not lose and playing to win. It's not the same thing. Playing to win is not the same thing as playing to not lose. Playing to not lose says, hey, I'm good as long as I just keep what I got. As long as I can just maintain where I'm at, I'm okay. Playing to win says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm nowhere near what God's called me to. I'm not there yet. I'm in a good place. But he said that he would take me from grace to grace, from glory to glory, that there's, that there's a new place and a new level for me if I would press into it. And this is a choice, a choice that victors and winners choose. Victors and winners choose to press. In the Bible, there's a boy named David who knew how to press. 
He knew how to press. And we're going to talk about this boy named David in 1 Samuel 17. I'm not going to give you any backstory today. Uh, this boy David, he's standing before a giant. and He's going to fight this giant. And this is what it says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, him being David, David ran quickly toward the battle. Say this with me. David ran quickly toward the battle. David ran quickly toward the battle. David ran quickly toward. Let me ask you, when's the last time you ran toward a battle in your life? Because most of us see a battle coming, we see a struggle coming, we see a problem coming. Hey, I'm good. Or if you don't run away, at the least, you take your phone out and videotape it. I ain't going to do nothing about it, but I might get some money for this online. At least, world star! But David ran quickly toward his opponent. He ran quickly toward his opponent. I'm not going to give this thing one step into my life. I'm not going to pl- I'm not going to play with this thing. I'm not playing with this giant. See, see, see too many times we think we could play with these giants a- a- as if the giant won't at some point overpower us. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet Goliath. In verse 49, he said reaching into his bag, he took out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell to the ground. David ran and stood over him. He took out the sword from the Philistine, killed him, cut off his head. Then the Philistines saw that their hero was dead. They turned and they ran. You see, David pressed on on the battlefield. What did the word say? It says, as the giant moved closer, could you just imagine like a big, huge giant just kind of Slowly moving forward, fee, fi, fo, fum, right? David was just a little scrawny kid. He comes running toward the battle. He's running at the fight. He reaches into his bag. He grabs a, a stone, puts it in his slingshot, throws it, knocks the guy down, and he stands over him and he finishes the job. David pressed. David had energy. David had passion. David had faith. He was not reluctant to apply aggressive pressure. Now, there was time for strategies and there was times for wise counsel and advice, but there's also times where we simply need to press in our lives. There are times that we simply need to run at the issues that are happening in our lives. So I have a question. If you are not experiencing the life that you thought you should have, if you're not happy with the way that life is going right now, let me ask you this question. Are you pressing? Are you doing something about it? I find that so many times, even even, even here at this altar, people will come down and they will ask me for prayer. And before they ask me for prayer, they have to build their case and tell me all the problem first. To which I simply say, wait, do you want to just barf on me your problems or do you want to actually step in faith? Like really, I don't need your whole background to pray for you. What's the faith confession? Where are we going? What are we pressing through? Don't sit here and tell me the whole problem. I, honestly, I don't care about the problem. I care about the solution. Amen. What do you want prayer for? And what are you standing on? How are you pressing with this? Well, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? I mean, just, just pray for me. Pray for you what? That you can read your Bible and find a verse? What are you fighting with? What are you pressing on with? We're going to get to that. I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead. All right? Are you running at your dreams or are you running from disappointment of your dreams? 
Are you attacking the obstacles that are ahead of you? What are you allowing to stand in your way? What giant has stood in your way? Like, are you putting pressure on doubt and fear? Are you putting pressure on debt? Are you pressing against bad health? Or are you just accepting that this is the way life is supposed to be? Are you pressing when it comes to sharing Jesus with others who desperately, desperately need? Are you, are you pressing? Do you know why most people don't press when it comes to telling their friends about Jesus? Because they fear rejection. They fear rejection. Um, I'm not a very tall man. I don't know if you can tell. I know I look taller on stage. I'm only about 6'7". <laughs> Greater is he that is in me. No, I'm 5'7". And so I played a lot of basketball as a kid. And one thing playing basketball, so my best friend was 6'8". No lie, at like 13. And I was like 5'2". And we played a lot of basketball. I learned very quickly, do not try to come inside for a layup against somebody who is 6'8". Because he would hit that ball, he would snuff that ball out of my hand so hard. He would reject my shot. I would be coming in and he would reject my shot. Now, growing up in Scotchtown, now we weren't privileged to be upper Scotchtown, we were lower Scotchtown. In lower Scotchtown, if you went up for a shot or, you know, or, or to shoot the ball and someone snuffed the ball out of your hand, everybody did what? Oh! And then would run onto the field and you'd, oh! Oh! We had a lot of fist fights in Scotchtown. There were a lot of times I picked up the ball, oh yeah, and I walked home. <laughs> because we all feared rejection, being rejected, trying our best, but someone rejecting what we're doing. When, when it comes to sharing your faith and evangelizing, you got to understand, people aren't rejecting you. They're rejecting the gospel. They're rejecting the message. But the biggest fear, here, here's the biggest fear. Wonder if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer. Then you tell them you don't know the answer. I have to look it up. I'll have to ask somebody who reads their Bible. I don't know. I don't know. It's okay to say I don't know. It's okay for them to ask you a ton of questions and you say, I know I'm still learning. Let me write your question down. And I'll go ask somebody. But I will come back to you. And we can finish this conversation. Right? Are you pressing when it matters the most? And isn't that such a tricky phrase, when it matters the most? Because what defines the important moments in our life? What makes one instance of time more important than the other? It's a tricky phase. Many of us think the last two minutes of a football game are the most important, that two-minute drill. What's that quarterback going to do in the two-minute drill? The last shot in the basketball game as the clock is winding down. The ball comes in bounds. They bring it down. Oh, and on the shot clock is five, four, three. Two, one, and see, I tried. I tried. I guess I guess this isn't my season. It's not my season. It's not my time. Man, that was my shot. That was my shot at life. That was my moment. In our lives, the moments of decision when the pressure is on, we say that these are the moments that matter the most, but here's the truth. Are you ready? 
every moment of your life matters. Every moment with your children matters. Every moment with your spouse matters. Every moment with your friends matters. Every moment at your job matters. There's no unimportant moments in life because life is short. I'll go a step further to tell you this, that all your moments in life are equally important. All your moments in life are equally important. The time an athlete spends in preparation is as equally important as game day. The basketball player who missed the shot as the buzzer went down gets back to the gym when no one's around, just a cart of basketballs. I'm not going to miss that shot again. I'm not going to miss that shot again. I'm going to get in the pocket. I'm going to get in the po. Oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get in the pocket. Come on, man. Where's your hands, bro? That was, that was your opportunity of a lifetime right there to be on TV. All right. All right. So so now I feel it. I feel it. So I feel it. I got the, I got the, I got the, I got the feeling down. I, I, I know. I think I. Okay. Okay. And what happens? What happens? I built some. You get hot. I built something called what? She said I was hot. <laughs> we built something called muscle memory. Muscle memory. Have you heard of this, muscle memory? You know, I, because now I feel the amount of pressure I have to apply to the ball. I feel where my feet were and, and how my arm, how my wrist comes forward. I get the muscle memory, so now I can keep making that shot over and over and over again. When the pressure's on, I know how I'm going to react and what it feels like because I have the muscle memory. And here's the truth. The reason why many Christians are defeated today they don't have a muscle memory to pull from. They're not practicing victory in their personal life. They're not practicing what do I do when the enemy comes knocking? How do I respond to this situation when sickness comes? What do I do when depression tries to knock me down? How do I respond to this? And we don't know how to respond because we don't have the muscle memory. We have to put the practice in. When I put, when I put in the time in, David defeated Goliath with a slingshot. And you'd be foolish to think that a slingshot is a child's toy. In this time, a slingshot was actually a military weapon. It was as if David was in the field protecting his daddy's sheep with an AR-15. It was a military-grade weapon of the time. The stone would come out of the slingshot at 60 miles an hour. In Judges chapter 20, verse 16, it says this. It says that the Israelites, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed. I don't know what that means. I'm right-handed. I don't know why they were selected and not someone like me, but left-handed men, watch, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Now, we're not talking about a bunny rabbit hair. We're talking about like a hair on a head that I don't have. Like, they could throw a rock at a piece of hair from a distance and not miss. These were military men using slings in battle. They were accurate enough to hit a strand of hair from a distance. They, could, they had archer-like accuracy with, with this dangerous weapon. And to develop the technique of a sling, it took time. It took practice. 
It took patience. It took preparation. Someone practiced with great effort and time before they ever entered battle. And listen, to master anything in your life, it takes practice. It takes persistence because you're not always going to hit the mark. So we got to build the muscle memory. We got to build the muscle memory so we know what our response is. Mm. I wondered why, why would you let somebody have half the court before you attack? Why wouldn't you always do the full court press. They don't have enough energy to do that the whole game. It's exhausting to play with that much pressure. It's exhausting to be like this the whole time. So they take their break. They jog back. Then they get into position. They give themselves that moment. Because there's not always going to be moments that we have to be going crazy pressing. But are you ready for those moments when they come? David spent much of his time in a field tending his daddy's sheep. And many would think that that was an unimportant task. Some would say that those moments surely were not as important as the moment that he stood before the giant. But it was in those moments that David pressed Pressed and practiced so that he was prepared for the battlefield. So many believers today are overtaken, not just by sin, but are overtaken by anxiety and depression. <laughs> just, just hear me out, because I understand it. We get so overtaken by anxiety and depression when the Bible promises us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. That we should have the joy of the Lord. That we should have the peace that surpasses all understanding. But we're falling on the battlefield just like everybody else because we don't know the muscle memory. We don't have the practice. I'm jumping ahead in my notes a few weeks ago, Pastor Bryant preached a message, and he used this song. He said, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Right? And then you're jamming out. This is how I fight my battles. Do we even know how we fight our battles? Do we even got a game plan, like a, a battle plan? Do we even have the strategy? Well, huh, well, uh, well, 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 what do you mean Exactly. What I'm saying exactly is, do you got a plan for when the enemy punches you in the mouth? Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan <laughs> until you punch him in the mouth. And I think that's what happens sometimes. We don't really got a plan. We get punched in the mouth by the enemy, and we WebMD it. What does WebMD say? What does Google say? Why am I feeling this way? And we actually make ourselves more sick because we believe what those symptoms on the computer say instead of what the Word of God says. <laughs> David spent much time in practice before he ever stood on a battlefield in front of a giant. This is where David learned the skills to take down the giant. David needed to practice his skill before he stood in front of Goliath. And I'm just feeling the Holy Spirit take me somewhere real quick. Nobody heard this. This is third service only. A lot of people come into our church, and they immediately want to use their giftings and their talents and their abilities on the stage in front of the church. They immediately want to come in and, well, you know, I'm gifted. I play the piano, and I'm gifted. I sing like an angel. And they want to get up here and here. And you know what? I don't let them. Do you know why? Because they're going to get sick. They're going to get hurt. They're going to get damaged because they're not prepared for the battle. 
It happens time and time and time again. Someone comes on staff, they, they want to come on staff. Hey, I want to work at the church. And within months, their life's a wreck and they're gone. Yeah, it's a passage in the Bible. Paul's talking. He said, lest I be exalted above measure. And your church might have talked that that was about pride. Lest I stand up and change the world. Lest I be exalted above measure. See, everybody's sitting down, so you can't really see anybody in particular. But if one person were to stand up, they're exalted above measure. Measure is seated. But now that I stand up, what do they become? A target. Lest I stand up and do something and change the world for Jesus Christ, Satan sent a messenger to take me out, to knock me down, lest I be exalted above measure. We don't just let anybody come up here because they're going to get taken out. They're going to get hurt. So no, we're going to do discipleship, we're going to do classes, we're going to do Bible training, we're going to talk, uh, te teach you how to worship God and get into the spirit realm and build yourself up in your most holy faith. Why? So when the attack comes, this is how I fight my battle. You'll know how to fight the battle because we teach you to fight the battle. Do we know how to fight the battle? Too many times in the Christian life, we practice defeat instead of victory. And life is almost set up that way that we practice defeat all the time. In fact, before you got married, you practiced divorce a couple times. <laughs> Broken relationships. Dating somebody, broke up. Date somebody, break up. Date somebody, break up. And what'd you do? You practiced getting divorced. So when the real battle came, I walked out 12 times on other people. I'm walking out now. I don't care. Ain't no different. This is my muscle memory. We practice defeat. We commit to diets and we break diets. And we commit to diets and we break diets. And we commit to diets and we break diets. Now listen. Here, here, here's the truth of the matter. We commit to do things for God and we break those commitments. But those are commitments that God never asked us to make. I'm going to be a better Christian. God never asked you for that. I'm going to read my Bible more. God never asked you for that. I'm going to pray more. God never asked you for that. And then when you break it, like you broke the diet and you broke up with your girlfriend, shame sets in. Guilt sets in, condemnation sets in, defeat, the ideas and the feelings of defeat set in, and that's what we rehearse and we practice. Say, well, you know, I can't stick to anything, I can't do anything, why would God want to use me? Why, why would God want to use me? And instead of us pressing, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. I can't play this game. I can't keep up. But, but, but you're committing to things and you're saying things that God never asked you for. He says, I just want you. I just want you. I don't want all these things that you think is going to impress me to be near me. Just be near me. Think about me. Bring me into the moments of your life. Have a relationship with me. Notice, rock somebody's world real quick, all right? You notice nowhere in the scripture did it say that an angel came and grabbed the stone and made it fly faster? Did you notice that? You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that an angel grabbed the stone and guided it. Nowhere does it say that the Spirit of God came upon David and he supernaturally threw the rock harder than he'd ever thrown it before. None of that is said. Because if that were the case, then David's practice would have been for nothing. I'm going to let that sit in for a second. But 
the culmination of everything of your life is building up for a moment, moments in your life, preparing you for moments in your life. David's practice and practice and practice and practice was preparation for a moment in his life. And then after he kills that giant, he used the momentum from that moment to kill every other giant that was alive in the land. Which moment was more important? The first giant, the second giant, third giant, the last giant? Every moment was as important as the practicing moment. Hitting a pear on a tree was as important as hitting a giant in the forehead. Mm. We most certainly, listen to what I'm about to tell you right now, we most certainly have our part to play in the thoughts that God has for us. We're so quick to quote Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. So what are you doing with his plans? That's great that he wrote a game plan, but you playing that game? That's great. Yeah, what are plans I have for you, says the Lord, for good and not evil? What's your part to play? What's your part to play in God's plan? What's your part to play? See, here, here's, here's what's happened. So many times, we play like it's, the game's already won. You ever seen those players where they intercept the ball and they're running it back and like five yards before the touchdown line, they start celebrating yeah. and somebody comes up behind them and swats the ball out of bounds? Dude, why didn't you just press to the goal line? Celebrate in the end zone. Celebrate in the end zone. Press through the mark, right? Don't act like you're not in a fight for your life. We all are. The problem is most of us don't act like we're in a fight until we're already bloody. Most of us don't act like we're in a fight until the doctor tells us we got cancer. Now we're going to worry about it. But all along you had little signs where you said, get this in control now. Get this under control now. Get this in check now. Fix this now. Put this right now. Mm. You ready for this? Deep statement. It's the deepest we're going to go today, and I want you to hear this very clearly. Humans create futures. Humans create futures. Humans create, you're not going to hear that in any other church around here this week. Humans create Futures. The future is not something that happens to us. The future is something that happens through us. We have a part to play in God's plan. We have a part to play in God's plan. Are you saying yes to his game plan? What if David never threw a rock? What if David didn't finish the job? What if David said, well, I'm only good with a slingshot, guys. I've never wielded a sword. The giant would have got back up. How many times did we leave the job undone in our lives? How many times did we wound the giants in our lives, the problems in our lives? We wound it. We throw, we throw rocks at it, but we don't run over and finish the job. You tried getting out of debt, then the car broke down, and you left the giant staggering. Didn't finish it. Say, so look, every time I try, something else happens. What's the use? Tried working on that relationship, and then another fight breaks out. Another disappointment happens. I'm just, I'm just so tired. I'm fighting. You see, another great point to practice is that it builds endurance. Practice builds endurance so that we can fight longer and fight through to the end. 
We are to make a conscious decision. Listen to what I'm about to say. We are to make a conscious decision to partner with God. We are to make a conscious decision to partner with God to hit the targets of God's will for our lives. We sit back and say, well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. He said, this is my will, now go do. This is my will, now go do. This is my will, now go do. But we have to partner with God and play our part. Just like the full court press, it does no good for only one team member to be doing it. It takes everyone on the squad to do your part. So know what your part is and know what God's part is. I'm going to close with, with two things. I'm only, I didn't even get through half of my notes. All right. Here we go. Remember that you're on a team, so pass the ball. No one likes playing with a ball hog. No one likes playing with a ball hog. Before the pressure gets overwhelming in your life, before you get to a place that you feel like you're going to cave in, pass the ball to your Savior. He's wide open. He's wide open. And here's the beautiful thing about your Savior. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He's not just standing here saying, well, listen, if you want to give it to me, you got to come to where I am. No, man, he's making a way. Yo, 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 over here. Over. He, he's all over the place. He's making a way where there seems to be no way. He's moving around every obstacle. I'm open. Cast your cares on me. Cast your burdens on me. Those who are heavy laden and weary, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Pass me the ball. This rock is getting too heavy for you to carry. I'm open. Listen, second part to that is this. You have teammates in the body of Christ that are in their proper positions waiting to help you. Will you pass them the ball? Will you pass them the ball? Will you find somebody in our community to connect with and say, I can't do this alone. I need other people in my life. Will you be a lifeline to me? Will you be a life support to me? Get somebody's cell phone number, text them, hey, listen, you're on a team. One last thing is this. I need some water for that point. Don't be out of position yourself. Don't be out of position. Now, if you've been raised in some sort of church before, you think I'm talking about don't find yourself in sin. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm asking you is this. Who can count on you to be in your position that they can pass the ball to you? Are you doing right now what God's called you to do? Are you using your talents and your skills and your abilities to further the kingdom of God? Are you applying the principles that God has placed in you to further the kingdom of God, to win this game of life? Are you in your position? Are you in the place that God's called you to be, to do the job that only you can do? Get in position. Get in, you, do you know where my position was not? In basketball? Under the hoop. This was not my position. Don't put me here. I'm, I, I've never got a single rebound. I don't know what it's like to get a rebound. All right? I've been playing with guys who, I can't even touch that net if I jump. Look, that's not my position. My position was on the rim, out here. Throw me the ball out here. Because I practiced my shot all day. In fact, I had to learn how to do a fadeaway shot. Because the guys were so much taller than me. I couldn't even just come in and do a regular shot. I had to actually jump backwards when I would take a shot because they were so tall. They would always reject the ball. What's your 
position to play in the kingdom of God. Play your position. Play your position in a way that only you can. The problem is this. Everybody wants to be LeBron. No one wants to be the guy that passes the ball to LeBron to make LeBron LeBron. What's wrong with us? As if, as if everything rests on our shoulders. As if, if you play your part, play your part on the team that only you can play. And that's where you're going to find your fulfillment. That's where you're going to find your joy. That's where you're going to find your peace. Don't let somebody else get into your mind that, that, that your position is not as important as somebody else. That your game isn't as good as somebody else. Do what God has called you. Know what your part to play is. Know what God's part to play is. And you're going to win this game if you don't walk off the court. Just stay on it. He says, when you've done all to stand, stand. The people who win at this, they just didn't quit. They've lost innings, they've lost downs, they've lost all these sort of things, but they kept coming back. That's how you win at this thing. Father, we come to your name of Jesus. We thank you today. We thank you for speaking to our hearts, speaking to our minds, showing us things to come. I thank you, Lord, that we are not alone, that there's others around us dealing with and going through the same things, but you promised us the victory. So help us, God, to practice our part, to put the time in, to know what our reactions are to be and how to handle these situations. Father, I thank you and I praise you that your Holy Spirit will rise up on the inside of us and quicken us and energize us and restore us. If there's those who came in here today hurting broken, looking for love, looking for connection, God, they would hear your voice say, welcome home. Welcome home. Father, we thank you today that we will win at this game, at this life that you've called us to. As we leave here today, Lord, we are blessed. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend.